Hey Hopewell family, we're back with another fusion lesson. Uh, just so you guys know, we are coming out of our purity uh, series where we were talking about sexual and just relationship purity and how we handle that as teenagers and how we look uh, toward dating and approaching dating with the end goal in mind. And this, these next couple of weeks, we're actually moving into a series kind of expounding on that a little bit because that's, that's kind of like one small focus when it comes to purity, when really what the Bible is calling us to is personal purity or holiness. So as we move into this series, um, we're, if we need to understand that if we're going to understand how we're supposed to live and how the Bible calls us to live as Christians, we need to understand really who it is that we're serving. And there's a lot of different answers to that question. Uh, if God is holy and we are called to live as a people uh, who are set apart for him, uh, we're not made holy by anything we do. We want to be clear about that too. Um, a lot of times we can get caught in the striving and trying to be better people and trying to be better all the time and we do it in our own strength and that can cause a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, it has in my own life. I shared uh, again with the teens when we were live in the room that that's something that's caused a lot of anxiety in my life as well where I'm just kind of like focusing on doing it in my own power. But it's not about anything that we do but what God does in us to make us holy. So, so to open the session really I want to ask a question. What do you mean when you say you believe in God? Who is God? What does your view of him look like? Because that's important to understand or, or try to like nail down when it comes into approaching this question. Because a lot of times, you know, we can hear answers from, oh, well, you know, God's my savior or, or God is God or, um, you know, God is the one who kind of tells us what to do or God is maybe an angry father to you uh, sitting on the throne uh, just, just waiting for you to mess up or God's the creator of the universe, or what have you. But it's important to kind of nail down our definition on how we view God, because that's gonna inform how we move with gratitude into what he's done for us in making us holy and living holy lives after his heart. So the first thing we talked about is, again, we need to understand God first. So holiness, what is, what is holiness? When we talk about holiness, what we're really talking about is that word literally means set apart. We are set apart. Just like ancient, ancient Israel was supposed to be set apart from their culture and they were supposed to live differently, they were supposed to be different. Uh, that's what holiness means to us. So what does it mean to be set apart? That's important to understand. But who is God? You know, God is, God is much more than we can probably define in one word or one sentence. But really, he's the creative force behind the creation of the universe. Now think about how powerful you would have to be, how wise you would have to be, to make everything fine-tuned to work perfectly and to be able to be so sovereign that you can work through history. And we shared this at church a few times as well. But his power is unmatched and there is no one like him. And that's what, mean, that's what it means for him to be holy. He is completely other. He is completely unique. He, as an entity, is actually set apart from anything else that we could comprehend. His nature, his very nature, is the standard of goodness and purity. Sometimes we struggle to, to understand or believe that God is actually the standard of goodness because with our own human eyes and our own human perspective, we can look at God and be like, man, I wouldn't have done it that way. But we have to remember that we're not God and that he has reasons. And if we actually trust that he's good, then he, that he is the standard of goodness and purity, then we really have no other choice that is smart or wise, uh, but to follow what he would have to say about these things. So another thing we need to understand is that our nature is not holy. God is other. God is unique from us. And our nature is not holy, especially now that we're in a fallen state as humanity. But, you know, when, we're, when, when you take the imperfection of us and match it to the perfection of God that we're trying to suggest here, right? God's presence is actually danger, dangerous to us. Not because his presence is bad, but just because we are so fallen in that, in, in that state. We are so under that state that he's in that entering that presence with impurity actually does harm to us. And we see that all over the Old Testament when people came into contact with God's glory uh, or God's presence and they died. And that's pretty crazy, right? But again, it's not because it's bad. It's just because it's so powerful and so completely other from us that it, beca it became dangerous. Um, the way you can look at it is like the sun. The sun is not bad. In its nature, the sun is just kind of up there, but it's so powerful with radiation and heat and fire and like nuclear fusion and all this kind of crazy stuff. 
uh, that, you know, if we were to take a trip to the sun right now, I'll jump in a rocket ship, how close do you think we could get to the sun before we utterly disintegrate? And that's kind of what we're talking about. The sun is not bad. Again, the sun is just the sun. And something that's not the sun gets too close to the sun, the sun completely obliterates it. And that's kind of how you can look at a vision of, of God's holiness as we, who are not like his holiness, approach him with impurity, it completely destroys us. And that's kind of you know, what it looks like, especially in the Old Testament when we talk about like Leviticus and things like that. Uh, when people came into contact with God, God's presence, it was dangerous to them. So the solution, though, for our imperfect nature that God gave to us in the Old Testament, that God gave Israel in the Old Testament, was to become pure. And the good thing about God is that he made a way for that to happen. Whether you were like morally impure and you needed to do sin offerings, or whether you, you were ritually unclean, meaning you came into contact with impurity and you needed to purify that, he made ritual, uh, rituals in place so that way you would actually be able to become pure and enter into God's presence. So the book of Leviticus gave Israel instructions on how to do this uh, morally and ritually before God. But, you know, as, let's look at the, at the book of Leviticus for a second, because none of us really like to read it, if we're honest. But it's actually structured in, in, a, in a pretty cool way. When you look at the entire book of Leviticus like a line, right, basically what you have on the two bookends, uh, the, the, the front and the back of the book, is all talking about ritual purification and how we can become ritually pure before God. And as you move in towards the center, it talks about the moral things that we could do to be pure before God. Obviously, showing us that we can't ever actually match that level of moral, moral purity that we would need in order to enter God's presence. And then something interesting happens smack dab in the middle of the book, in Leviticus 16, where it introduces the Day of Atonement, or this, uh, this idea of atonement, this, this idea of something being able to substitute itself substitute itself for you so that way it could take on your impurity so you could become pure before God. And, and that's really a beautiful picture of the gospel. But when we look at, um, at Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about the Day of Atonement, which is something that Jews actually still celebrate. And basically, it's just got a bunch of rules of what the, what the priest was supposed to do on this particular day to atone for the sins of the nation of Israel, uh, both for himself and, and what he would do otherwise. And it, it basically has this ritual where um, you know, Aaron, the high priest, was supposed to take two goats and he was basically supposed to slaughter one uh, for his own sins, slaughter and sacrifice one for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people on the other goat, he would lay his hands on it, and he would confess the sins of the people, and that, that goat figuratively would take on the, the, the sins and the, the iniquities of the people, and then he would send it far out into the wilderness to be completely separated from the people. This goat took on the sinfulness of the entire nation and took it far away from them. So that's where we get the, the term scapegoat, actually, if you've heard it. That's where we get that from. This, this goat, this, this, this pure animal, this blameless animal was taking on the sins of the people. All, the, all of the blame and all of the sin was placed on this animal and it was sent away from the people. But this was obviously meant to be a shadow of how God would accomplish our redemption, our redemption ultimately in Christ. And so the last thing that we need to understand, right, is like our holiness doesn't come from anything that we can try to do for God. It doesn't come from our own strength, but it's God who makes us holy. Uh, I, in the story of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7, it's basically Isaiah's, Isaiah's vision of the throne room of God. And there's a bunch of crazy animals and everything else, but he comes into contact with the purity of God on his throne and the glory of God in his throne room. And, you know, he, he, ba he basically says this. This is Isaiah. And then he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm seeing this, right? Because I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of armies. He's coming into contact with the glory of God, and he just sees how utterly short he falls uh, to being able to stand in his presence blameless because he knows that he's not. And that's the way that we respond to divinity. Peter did the same thing when he encountered the divinity of Christ when, you know, the whole the whole thing where, you know, Peter was supposed to cast his net one more time and then he got like more fish than he could ever count. Um, in the boat, and he, he's encountering divinity at that point. He falls to his knees and he says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. And that's kind of the, the reaction that we have when we actually encounter and understand the divinity of Christ and of, of God the Father in the Old Testament as well. And that's what Isaiah is, is, is experiencing here.
But then something interesting happens because the Old Testament is full of things that you would have to do to make yourself pure. And, and up to this point, Isaiah hasn't done anything outside of what he's already supposed to do to make himself pure. But what, what happens? This is interesting. One of the seraphim, one of the angels, one of the uh, living beings in heaven, flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongues. And he touched my mouth with it and he said this, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. So now it's, it's no longer, from what, I, what Isaiah is suggesting here, it's no longer that we have to do things uh, to make ourselves pure. Actually, he reveals that we could have never done anything to make ourselves pure. Actually, all through the Old Testament, it was God's grace that was allowing people, imperfect people, into his presence. But you see here what happens in heaven. What is God's way of doing this? God's way of doing this is taking this holy object and touching us with it. And rather than, uh, rather than us taking on the impurity of something that we've touched, we're now taking on the holiness of something that he touched us with. And that's so beautiful to me. Um, you think of it this way, and we did this little illustration. So if you, you picture basically like muddy water. And if, you know, if I ask you to come up and just like dip both of your hands in the muddy water, and then I'm gonna hand you this rag, this white rag that just symbolizes purity. What happens as you dry off and you clean off your hands with that rag? Well, your hands become clean. You become holy. But what happens to the rag? It's muddy. It's wet. It took on the impurity. And the New Testament tells us that, you know, Jesus, talking about Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin. He took on our impurity so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the example of that holy object that comes out of heaven and touches humanity with it, making it pure through faith in him. You know, at the end of that chapter in Isaiah, chapter 6, it talks about, it talks about all this like death and destruction that was going to happen with the nation of Israel, but then promised a holy seed, the stump, that the thing that was left would be a holy seed that would bring life, that would bring restoration, that would bring holiness to a fallen world. And, and really the last thing that we want, to, we want to cover is kind of like, what does this look like? What are the implications of this on us? So for that, we went to 1 Peter, uh, the, Peter's first letter uh, that we have, uh, chapter 1, verses 14 to 19. And I'm just going to read it and then we're going to pick it apart and just kind of understand what this really means for us. And it's subtitled, I, I'm reading out of the CSV, but it's a call to holy living. And he says this, starting in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all of your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially, without favoritism, according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence, during this time living as strangers or exiles. And that's, that's exactly what we are as Christians on this fallen earth, this, this not completely redeemed earth. We are, we are living as sojourners and exiles here. For you know that you are redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold. We could not buy our way out of our fallen nature, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. So we can see like the typology and, and what God's really trying to communicate and his principle of how he actually accomplishes our atonement is to pay a priceless value for our lives. And so now we've been bought. We are no, it's, Paul, says, Paul says in uh, I think 1 Corinthians that we are not our own. We have been bought with a great price. And because of the holiness of God and the way that he operates to bring holiness to the world, we're called to live a certain way, and that's called holiness. That's called personal purity as we enter into this process called sanctification. And that's really what we're going to be talking about next week. It's this process by which the Holy Spirit is coming into us and empowering us to be able to put our sin and our ignorance and our fallen ways to death continually as we go throughout this life as a process by which we become more like Christ. And he empowers us to do this by his strength not ours. Hope to see you next week.